Election 2020, it offers a dichotomy. It shows us during this time that people have decided there are two sides to this thing. Some on the left, some on the right. No matter what the outcome, people are going to say, I won, you lost, or you lost, and I won. And during this period of time, emotions and feelings are going to rise because of a choice that was made. We find ourselves today in Mount Rubido, in Monte Praise, and Rubido Nation, at a crossroad of a choice. And unfortunately, often, we have to choose sides. Who's right, who's wrong? And this has placed us through a very emotional time. And so, as leaders here at Rubido, we've chosen to go through a specific step that will help us make it through. We're going to go through four parts. We're going to go through the night, through the wandering, through the water, and through it all. But today, post-election, I want to tell you, we will make it through the night. It starts out with a story. Here we find the children of Israel in the book of Exodus on the hills of prosperity. Everything is going well. The people are happy. It even appears as though the animals and land are happy. Happiness is everywhere. We are happy even in a home without a roof. That's how deep the happiness is. But all of a sudden, things began to change. Those who are over Israel began to become jealous of Israel. Prosperity brought persecution. They decided that because of the prosperity of this nation, one day they may choose, if war break out, they may choose the other side. So Pharaoh, who didn't know the previous leader, decided enough is enough. And what did they do? They put a burden on the people. They pressed them. They tried to get them to do the same thing they were doing, but with less. I have to tell you that we find ourselves in this same situation. You see, like the children of Israel, God has been very prosperous to us here at Mount Rubido, Imani, and Ruby Nation. And the enemy is angry. He decided that we can't afford this because they are going to tear our kingdom down. And he began to try to disrupt it. But I'm here to tell you that despite all the disruption, God still is with his people. God decided to call Israel its firstborn. He said, you're my firstborn, meaning that I have a special place in my heart for you. I am not going to let you go. And I will do everything I can to save you. And so he took them through a process. I'd like to tell you that this process began first in the daytime. We often hear the phrase that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. But if you go back to Genesis, we find out that a day consists of daytime first and then night. In the daytime, the pressure came. In the daytime, the persecution came. In the daytime, the discouragement came. In the daytime, the doubt came. Because all of a sudden, God's people no longer felt as though they were God's people because they felt as though favor was not upon them. And sometimes we feel that way. We can have all of God's favor, have a job, have a home, have a spouse, have everything going well, but when things turn south, we can believe we no longer have favor. The children of Israel got a message. That message came from God because they cried out to God. They cried out to God to deliver them, but they were specific about what they wanted to be delivered for. They said, deliver us so that we may worship you. Now, those are powerful words, and I know they're words that cause God to respond because he said, hey, in the midst of all of this, my people still understand that the most important thing is that they worship me. So God took action. He had a 10-step plan. That 10-step plan came through Moses and through Aaron, and that is 
to let Pharaoh know how significant his people are to him. He put what I call the 10 steps in place, the 10 plagues. And each plague was offered to Pharaoh as an opportunity for Pharaoh to change his mind. God does not leave us in the midst of our discouragement. He has an action plan a plan in place to demonstrate to us, his chosen ones, his firstborn, that he will see to it that we are delivered. But the deliverer won't necessarily let us go that easy. You see, it's like a man who may have a friend that he's been engaged with for years, and finally they have this breakup, and they turn around, and it takes a long time to break up. I broke up with a girl once I dated at Oakwood, and I'll never forget, we broke up, but it took a year to break up. Breaking up is not easy to do. So the children of Israel and Pharaoh went through this love-hate relationship over a period of time, and God intervened by trying to suggest to Pharaoh, let my people go. My people who insisted that they wanted to let, be let go so that they may worship me. And he tried the first time, it didn't work. The second time, it didn't work. The second, third time, it didn't work. The fourth time, it didn't work. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and finally, the tenth time. It was the tenth time that brings us to this dark point. It was the tenth time that puts us in this depth of doubt. It was the tenth time where God really demonstrated and showed his power. Remember, I told you, all of this started in the daylight. It started out with prosperity and ended up with poverty. The children of Israel were struggling and God was fighting in their behalf and he was trying to convince Pharaoh, the best thing for you to do is let my people go. And so Pharaoh finally decided that he was going to let them go but not before the children of Israel entered into the night. They went into the night. God commanded them, go in the house. He told them to stay in the house. And he said, before you go in the house, here are the preparation steps. I want you to take blood of a lamb, put it on the doorpost. He said, and then I want you to take a lamb into the house. And I want you to partake of that lamb. I also want you to take herbs that are bitter, and I want you to take bread that is tasteless, but I want you to stay in the house. You see, you and I must understand when we are going through our shock and awe, our shock and numbness, that God says the best place for us to be is in a house that's covered by the blood with the lamb, with the bitter, and with the tasteless. And he says, stay in the house. In other words, don't come out. No matter what you hear, no matter how you feel, I want you to stay in the house. But not in the house alone. Stay in the house together with family, with friends who are believers just like you. I want you to stay in the house. It might be bitter, but it's better in the house. It might be tasteless, but it's a test you can pass in the house. We must stay in the house no matter how dark it is. You see, because the darkness in the house is different from the darkness out of the house. Out of the house, the darkness was so thick that it is stated that the, is- that the Egyptian could feel the darkness and they could not even see each other. And it said that the darkness was even within their chambers. Now, that amazed me because I'm trying to figure out. They lit candles, so they must have had light. But one historian said that the darkness was so dark and damp that it even prevented candles from being lit. But in the house, their candles were lit. You see, they had the light of the world with them as well as candles. And so they had light. God told them to stay in the house. It might be bitter. It might be tasteless, but the safest place is in a house that's covered with the blood and that has the lamb. I recall one day when I was growing up, 
My mother used to leave us at home. And when she would go out the house, before she closed the door, she would say, now, stay in the house. She would say, don't open the door for anybody. Stay in the house. Well, we lived in the days where we didn't have peepholes. There were no peepholes such then. You depended on a knock and a voice in order for you to open the door. My mother walked out, but shortly after she walked out, a door was knocked on. It knocked on the door, and the first thing that we did was turn down the television and turn out the lights. We were going to act as though we weren't even there. Now, that's a good thing. We were going to pretend that we didn't even hear it. The knock kept coming. And then finally, there was a knock and a voice behind the knock. The man said, it's me. It's Charles. You can let me in. I went to the door. My family is sitting all around. But I separated from them and I opened the door only to find Charles standing there next to my mother. Oh, you thought there was weeping and wailing outside the house. Imagine what took place when my mother saw me open the door and let someone in the house. I learned a lesson there. I found out that when my mother left, I thought she was gone. But my mother ran into Charles at the bottom of the steps and he asked her, what are you doing? She said, I'm leaving. She said, but if you were going up, you're not going to get in because I told the kids not to open the door for anybody. Charles said, I bet you they'll open it for me. My mother, having confidence in us, said, oh, no, they are not going to let you in because I told them not to open the door for anybody. Charles said, I bet you I can get in. So they placed a bet. And when Charles came to the door, he won the bet. I'm here to tell you, Mount Rubido, Imani, and Rubination, that God has asked us in the midst of all of this shock and awe to stay in the house. But there's a controversy going outside the house. The enemy is saying, oh no, they will let me in. But God is saying, I told them to stay in the house and they will not let you in. He said, oh yes, they will. God said, no, they won't. And then he proceeds to knock on the door. Oh, but watch this. He knocks on the door with texting. He knocks on the door with email. He knocks on the door with Instagram. He knocks on the door with all types of communication that would get you to open the door to your heart that is supposed to be covered with the blood of the lamb. You should be gathered together, though it's bitter and tasteless, because there's safety in the house. You and I must understand that we must guard the avenues of our soul when we are going through a darkness that is impossible that we cannot see through, we cannot reach through, but we must do what God said. We've got to stay in the house in the night. We've got to stay in the house in the darkness. We've got to stay in the house in the doubt. And we don't stay alone. We stay with others. You and I must understand, outside the house is disobedience to God. Nothing but an enemy who has placed a bet to say, even though they say, let me go so that I may worship you, they may choose another. You and I are going through these stages. I called them four stages. Bowlby, who was a psychologist, came up with this theory. And he stated that there are four stages of relational grief. We're going through a relational grief. This is not the typical grief that you go through when a person dies or has terminal illness. This is one of a broken relationship. And they say that you go through this thing called ambiguous loss, where you don't have the answer. You don't know what to say. You are confused and, and you are afraid. But in this first stage of numbness, of shock, it says that you don't understand. But God says to us in that first stage, stay in the house. I'll give you guidelines to prepare. And those guidelines is that when you get in the house, first cover it with the blood. 
take a lamb, then take the bread, and he says, take bitter herbs. But here's what he said. This day is designed for you to commemorate not what's going on in the house, but how good God was to you before he led you in this house. And so you need to commemorate. God's been good to you over the years. God has blessed this church. God has blessed individuals. God has blessed the community. And no matter what you are going through in the darkness, celebrate, commemorate how good God has been to you in the past. It says you have nothing to fear for the future itself except you forget how God has blessed you in the past. So as I close, I want you to understand that we need to stay in the house. In the house is a lamb. In the house is bitterness that one day will be turned sweet. In the house is unleavened that one day will be leavened. But in the house are memories of how good God has been to you. And so I make an appeal. It's nighttime. For you personally, it's nighttime for us as a group. But are you willing to place the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your home and your heart so that no matter what happens, it passes over? Are you willing to take the lamb in the house and let him reside in your family, in your church, in your group so that you can be comforted? by the presence of the Lamb? Are you willing to endure the bitter until it comes better in the house because it's the safest place that you can be? And last but not least, are you willing to accept the tasteless until the day comes where you cry out, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is good in the daytime, but God is also good in the night. And on next week, we're going to see God do something miraculous as he leads us from the night to the wandering. I encourage you to stay with us all through the month of November as we go from night time to the wandering time, to the water time, until they threw it all. As I close, I was watching Cosby. And I'll never forget one day, Cosby's parents were celebrating a major anniversary. And the grandparents came into the house and when they walked into the house, they told them to be seated. They sat down waiting to see what's taking place. The family had a surprise for them. All of a sudden, the giddy kids ran downstairs and reached over and put a record on. And the record began to play and you saw everybody in motion moving to the music. Well, that song that they were moving to had these words in it. Nighttime is the right time to be with the one you love. I'm here to tell you, if God were here today, he'd come down the staircase with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they'd have background angels who would be swinging their wings. And they'd put the song on. And in karaoke style, they would break out. Nighttime is the right time to be with the God who loves you. And so, you're not alone. God is in your nighttime. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Father, we are going through a night. But in that night, we still have the blood on the doorposts of our hearts. In that night, the Lamb of God is precious to us. In that night, it might be bitter, but it will get better. And in that night of tastelessness, we will see that day where we cry out, 
Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And in that night, let us recount. Let us count our blessings, naming them one by one. Thank you for the ministry of Mount Rubido, Imani, and Ruby Nation, because we will get through the night.